No mai, haere mai, and welcome to Tamaki Makaurau Aotearoa, Auckland, New Zealand, home to the 36th America's Cup on the eve of the Prada Cup, the Challenger Selection Series that determines who will go against Emirates Team New Zealand in the 36th America's Cup match. Tomorrow it is game on for the challenges, or the designing, the refining, the adjustments, the training, the practice racing is all done because tomorrow it all counts for real. But only two teams can go through to the Prada Cup final and then won onto the America's Cup match and this is how it works out. The crazy thing is that no team is out of it right till the end. Four round robins of three races each, a seven race semi-final and a 13 race final. Each win scores a point. The challenger with the highest points at the end of round robin goes directly to the Prada Cup final. The remaining two challengers then battle it out in the semi-final. The first to four win makes the Prada Cup final. In that series, the first to wins the Prada Cup. After that, it's the America's Cup match. So it's four round robins over the next two weekends. Racing's Friday to Sundays with a total of 12 races to capture your attention and trust us, these AC75s make you stand up and take notice. And we're going to make sure that you stand up and take notice because we have got the best sailing experts on the planet. Beside me, double Olympic gold medalist and the host of the Shirley Robertson Sailing Podcast, it's Shirley Robinson, skipper on Artemis in the last two America's Cups and our foiling guru in Nathan Outeridge. And last and certainly not least, well, this guy, he's kind of a big deal. President of North Sales. He was the last skipper on a New York Yacht Club entry in the America's Cup here in New Zealand in 2003. And he's a multiple world champion. And that, of course, is our very own Kenny Reid. All right, team, these AC75s, this America's Cup cycle, how exciting are the 75s and what are we looking forward to here? Oh, Stephen, I have the best seat in the house. I'm in Chase Boat One. We are the boat that follows around all the action. And every day I am so excited and amazed by the boats. We knew they were going to be quick, but as the teams have got more and more confident in them, as the systems and the technology have developed, they are pushing harder and harder. And the racing, already it's mouth-watering. Just imagine what it's going to look like when it actually matters. Nathan, I reckon you are just hanging out to be on one of these boats, right? They are cool. I think me and anyone else who <laughs> love high performance foiling boats wants to be on these boats and be racing them. I've you know been living in New Zealand now for the past year watching everyone training and watching the teams get better and better and man the racing we saw in December was was really exciting and I think we're going to be in for a good show and as Shirley said it, it counts now so there's there's no excuses for oh we're still in training mode no no you've got to get some results and you've got to get better. Kenny we've been in training mode all three of us <laughs> and I've never seen anyone so excited about these falling mana holes like you. Well as like Nathan said as people who are in the sport our whole lives the three of us it's the rate of improvement that's getting made. These boats are literally going faster by the day and that just think about that we're not talking a tenth of a knot we're talking multiple knots. We're, at the beginning of this event we were talking about maybe breaking the 50 knot barrier now it's like pfft, piece of cake easy so if this keeps going who, who knows where we're going to be in the end it's really for some crazy wild fun sailing Let's go deeper into the teams right now, and they are all rock star teams. We will start with Enios Team UK. How rock star? I got a four time Olympian, Sir Ben Ainsley on the helm, and basically the boss. But Kenny, their America's Cup World Series, not good. What went wrong? Well, I, I'm sure they're asking themselves the same question. It's all about the lead up is about your design and your tools, but your tools are created by people. Did they have the tools right? Did they have their software correct in order to make simulations to, to find out how these boats were going to go? It could have been something as basic as the, the tools were wrong. But again, that is not, we're not talking about hammers and nails here, tools. We're talking about deep, deep software packages on supercomputers and really smart people in back rooms. So they got to figure out is, is, is the parts and pieces that they have on that boat, is it the parts or is it how they're using the parts? They've been improving now for, you know, the last week that we've seen them sailing, they have been improving, but they still got a long way to go, I think, to catch up to the rest of the group. Yeah, Kenny, like straight off that, like you could see they weren't performing the way they wanted to in the racing we saw in December. And I'm, I bet you every time you put a new piece of equipment on the boat, you need to analyze it and verify the, the VPP that, you know, they're using. And, you know, my feeling is, is that I've seen them change the foils between December and, and now. So clearly they were 
needing to modify their race foils or just check them against their old foils. They've also got a new rig in the boat, new sails coming, so they've been doing a lot of changes and what we've seen in the last couple of days is a faster boat. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. We're going to talk about Ben Aze. This, is, this, this cat you know pretty well, uh, Shirley. He is a, a, arguably one of the rock stars of this regatta. C can he drag this team all the way? I've been, you know, really impressed with Ben. I've known him a long time. I've been in the Olympic team with him. I've obviously been there when, he, when he's won his gold medals and in the last cup. But I've seen him here take on a real leadership role. You know, even when it was pretty tough for him before Christmas, he turned up at all the press conferences. You know, he did all the interviews. He stood in the room with his entire team and said, look, let's just keep chipping away. It's going to be, it's going to be all right. So I think he, he's, you know, he's really elevated himself amongst his team. But also in the training here, we've seen glimpses of that fire Ben Ainsley has. I mean, he wants to win. He feels now he's got a, a more competitive boat and goodness, you know, I feel we're right at the beginning with Ineos. Yeah, and we've seen development and we, t we tend to forget about it, don't we, Kenny? That This really, uh, the, the World Cup Series was a part of the development and we've seen how quickly they have developed before the start of the Prada Cup. Well, as we have, as I kind of stumbled across, Really, the, the calendar doesn't start yet for them. They, they need to be ready in about another two weeks' time once they get to that best of seven series. Of course, if they win this challenger round robin series, they move on and they become the number one seed. But I think they're looking at it differently. I think they're looking at every race day as a chance to improve. Uh, the more racing, the better. And they just, they need to be ready. And they got about another two weeks to go before it's really game on. It does the pressure ramp up with the, the, the Boston town, the Boston town and should Jim Ratcliffe? It's got to, hasn't it? I mean, Nathan knows about, you know, about sailing for an owner. He has massive expectations. He's given them the budget they need and they have the people they need. But, I, you know, I agree with with the boys, really. What we saw pre-Christmas was, was a testing phase. It was just very, very public and, I guess, hard to swallow when you're working day and night. I mean, that's the other thing. We've seen the light on in the shed every single night, 24-7, since, since the last race pre-Christmas. So they're working full on. How about American Magic now? They are another big rock star team. Back in the game for the first time in 18 years. Kenny, remember at the top of the show, we said he, he was last here in 2003 as the Helmsman. Didn't get the win. They actually think they can get the win. Nathan, they look like the challenger to beat. They were here early. Yeah, well, if we look at the racing from December, they were the top challenger. Uh, they beat Team New Zealand in one of the races, and they look quite quick. And, you know, I think that comes back to the fact that they were here first, they launched their boat, first they've been doing a lot of training they've been doing a lot of development and their racing skills are really sharp um, you know i look at them closely and analyze it and you know they're definitely better when the breeze is up but um you know right now they're the challenger to beat all right the one thing that we have all noticed the word development surely keeps coming up and the one thing you notice about american magic at a number of boats just the way the design has changed with boat two and Stephen, that's only the things we can see. I mean, there is a few visible changes with the Americans. You know, everyone can spot. They've got a, a longer skeg. It's deeper. It's a slightly different shape just to get the boat closer to the water, you know, to increase that end plate effect. Also, they've got some they've got some wacky sails. They've got a sail, they're calling the bat wing, where the batten stick out the back. It's it's smaller in area. You know, when your boats are going that quick, you don't need all that drag up there. So they've got a lot going on that we can see and a ton going on that we're yet to discover. Kenny, the, the one thing that the American Magic team bring is basically the backing of the New York Yacht Club. And it, it brings what we call in this country mana, a prestige, power to the regatta. You're a member of the New York Yacht Club. How big a deal is it, them being here, trying to get the old mud back? Well, it's, it's a bigger deal than you could imagine. I mean, all you have to do is walk into 44th Street, the clubhouse downtown New York City, and you just feel the aura, you feel the history, it's just oozing history. And there's that one little room in the back of the clubhouse that's, that's where the America's Cup was for a long time. And they want to put it back there. They want it in that glass case again, in the back room, uh, right by the bar in 44th Street. Uh, this team is prepared. I, I got to go sailing with them one day. They, they got me out on the boat. And uh, the, the thing that I was really, um, impressed with is that the, the mix of people, they have a bunch of young kids that, that are hungry and a bunch of veterans led by Terry Hutchinson and Dean Barker, of course, uh, that are kind of almost mentoring, bringing, bringing these young kids along. Uh, eyes wide open, 
you know, they, they, they really seem like they had their act together. Either that, they were putting on a good show for me that day. I'm not quite sure which, but it, they were very impressive. I got to ask this one, though. Terry Hutchinson, a 52-year-old grinder. I mean, how, how cool is that, right? Yeah, it's very impressive. You know, I don't think people understand how physical these boats are as grinders. And, you know, every person on the boat has to earn their position. And, you know, Terry's obviously been doing a great job, not just on the water, but in the gym and motivating the guys. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to see. Can we just go back to the hull comparison? Because when you take a look at, a look at the pictures, you go, it is dramatic, the change between boat one and boat two. And they still won't confirm it. <laughs> They've changed anything. I mean, that is the world we're operating in. Everything is a secret, even if it's not a secret. Um, but it, <laughs> it, it's intriguing, isn't it? You know, just, and it's interesting for us as well, you know, finding out what's going on, what the next change is. I mean, every day the boats are, are, are being progressed, they're in development, they've got a new bid added, and uh, it's a good game for us to find out exactly what it is. You'd like to know what's under that end plate, wouldn't you? You'd like to know what's really going on under there, because there's a lot of stuff there, right? I mean, that was major boat building, I think. I mean, again, their shed was working. They're working shifts through the night. And uh, all through Christmas, they were, I mean, they were working hard. All right. We talk about X factors, things that might change the way a team will operate. I wonder, Kenny, if Dean Barker, who has this, this, he knows these waters like the back of his hand. Is that, let's call it the hometown advantage and edge for him and American Magic? Well, there's something to be said for sleeping in your own bed at night, for example. I mean, we're, we're athletes but human beings at the same time being home is a really nice feature and and that has to be a comforting factor listen there's no this guy right next to me being one of them there's no question there's a lot of really good foiling helmsmen in the world dean barker's there a lot for for a big reason and that is terry's comfort level terry has sailed with dean a ton over the years uh he he trusts him. I think he trusts him. And you gotta trust you gotta trust the helmsman in a boat like this because one really bad move and the whole thing could come apart in two seconds. You gotta trust that person behind the wheel. I think Terry trusts Dean and they they just have a lot of miles together and uh, they're gonna put a few on a few more on before we leave. Time now to look at the challenger of record, Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli. The big question here for Nathan, being the challenger of record. Distraction or advantage? Well, it's probably a little bit of both. You know, there's always that distraction because you're always dealing with the, the legal battles that happen within the America's Cup. But I think there's a big advantage there because they were with Team New Zealand writing the rule for these boats. They got to stipulate a few things that they wanted to see in the boats. And as that progressed, they were able to start designing in the background before the rule was official and released to the other challenges. So, you know, if you look closely at their boat too, and compare it to boat one, it's a subtle change. You know, their boat one, they were very happy with. I've heard, you know, Francesco Bruni say m many times, we were happy with boat one. We had some structural issues, which meant they wanted to reinforce a few parts of the boat, optimize it slightly. And right now, if, if something goes wrong with boat two, they could put boat one back on the water and no one would probably know the difference. You know, there's a few techies out there that can see the subtle differences, but I think that's a pretty big advantage because if, you're already six months ahead on your challenges. You, you're very happy and it's about maintaining that advantage. And you know the one thing about the Italians, the design, it's the bell, it's the beautiful boat. We love it out there on the water. But the big chatter that's been going on, surely, Twin Helms, Francesco Bruni, Jimmy Spittle, is that their magic formula? Well, it seems to be working, doesn't it? I mean, the manoeuvres are really slick. There's not that kind of dodgy transition moment, uh, and particularly also in the pre-start, when things are happening really quickly. They are, they are so smooth. We hear a lot of comms as well coming off the boat. I mean, the only way, really, they can they can paint the tactical picture is just to keep keep that comms coming. Um, also, I guess that they wanted to have Jimmy in their team, but they also wanted an Italian skipper. So it, it kind of works out. Um, Bruni's on the left-hand side. He's left-handed, so he also flies the boat when he's not driving. So it's a complicated work in progress, I see, that we've only come, we've only seen come unstuck once. A really, you know, tight situation with another boat where it needed, you know, a, a last-minute decision, and then the wheels kind of fell off. And I think, you know, for any any helmsman or tactician out there, they'll they'll understand that. When you've lots of people not quite making the decision, then, you know, it, it's pretty hard. Yeah, and Max Serena, can he's desperate to have an Italian team win the cup and he would love this more than anything else in the world. Where do you see, from what you've seen so far, their strengths and their weaknesses? 
Uh, there's no question that their setup is more light air oriented right now. If, if we were sailing, you would say it's an Italian team from the Med, from a light air area. They happen to be really good in light air. I don't think it's quite that simple, of course, but uh, they are absolutely geared up for the lighter air. They're smoother on their foils. Uh, they seem to be quicker versus the group. When it breezes on, uh, we've heard, especially in comms coming off the boat, we've heard them talk a lot about right on the edge of control. And that means that they have some work to do. Probably with their foils, they still have another set of foils to go uh, before, before they use their allotment of six foils. That's under the water. And above the water, they're still making changes. They, they have changed from a no running backstay setup to a running backstay setup because the rest of the teams actually decided they were going to bring it to arbitration and talk about its legality. Sure enough, uh, they have to, at this stage, use their running backstays. And uh, all these little changes, all these little gear changes it makes a big difference at the end of the day. You talk about being desperate to actually to actually win uh, the America's Cup. This will be challenge number six, surely, uh, for the Italians, Luna Rossi. You know, Sir Thomas Lipton did did five of them. I mean, you got to really want this piece of silverware, don't you, to keep going? Twenty years. I mean, they first started here twenty years ago. I mean, it's it's an amazing dedication, but it's it's that thing. It's really difficult to win. It takes a long time. You've got to you've got to build up your your IP and your smarts, and it, you know it takes it takes a long time to do that. And um, but they're here and they're looking good. The question from all the challenges, and they've been quite vocal about it. How do you beat the defender, Emirates Team New Zealand, if you make it to the match? Well, Shirley, you've been on the water more than any of us. Why are they so good and how are they gonna, why are they going to be so tough to beat? Well, that's a question everyone's asking. I mean, they are the defenders, so they came up with the concept, they did the design. So we would expect them to be a click ahead in the development process. But Stephen, they are, they're fast. They're fast in a straight line. They're fast around the corners, you know, and they're fast even when they're in a bad position. They can stay there where the other teams fall away. So I think it's going to be an interesting month, this Prada Cup for the other teams. They have to make progress towards Emirates Team New Zealand. They just have to. Fast, Kenny. That's the, that's the big tick because a slow boat never won the America's Cup. So where do you see Emirates Team New Zealand making gains? Well, you split it into two different sections. Uh, the speed of the boat and all the bits and pieces that go into it and then of course the people and how they sail the boat so let's start with the bits I think they they've kept more back believe it or not they're they're going as faster faster than anybody right now but they may have kept more toys in the chest and actually not expose them for everybody else to see so far that's a big advantage because you got to figure that every generational leap is going to be a fa faster boat speed that in, in any bit that you put on board the boat then you get to the sailing part of it. You know, they haven't sailed well yet, honestly. And this upwind starting uh, sequence versus the reaching starting sequence, this has brought match racing back into the America's Cup, even more so than we saw when Nathan did it in Bermuda. Uh, Burling's got to get better at, at, at starting. There's just no question about it. We've seen a couple tenacious Peter Bur Burling moments out there, but maybe not enough of them yet. And that's something they're going to have to improve. All right, now let's go to the... Uh the practice day, practice day number one, and the biggest talking point of the practice day, Emirates Team New Zealand capsize. Spook them or not? Well, it was, a, it was a pretty spectacular capsize, wasn't it? I think the guys on these boats, you know, like Peter and Blair and uh, Glenn Ashby, they're used to sailing boats on the edge and they're used to capsizing it. And honestly, uh, it's not the first capsize they've done in a 75. They had two in their first boat. They capsized their little boat a few times. They capsized 49ers moths all the time. It's in a sailor's DNA to push it to the limit and capsize. And, man, wasn't it a great capsize the other day? It was a spectacular capsize. The great thing is they got it back up and right and going pretty quickly. Here was the reaction on board Emirates Team New Zealand after the capsize. Yeah, so we're just sailing downwind uh, against Ineos and um, went through a jibe. And I don't know whether we had a control problem or exactly what happened, but uh, here we sort of leaned over a lot more than normal and lifted up out of the water and over she went. We've talked about this a lot, practiced it, boats upright, we'll just check systems and that and should be ready to sail again. Yeah, we definitely got a little bit too high in the jive and yeah, it stopped pretty quick. It's a pretty big low case on the boat when the bow hit, so we just wanted to you know, do some checks. and. Yeah, but everything functionally was working pretty well on the boat, so we just, uh, yeah, towed on the foil on the way in, chatting on the way in there with the guys that, you know, that, that same kind of manoeuvre in the cat in Bermuda, you'd be in 
you know, hundreds of pieces where, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, full credit to the design of these boats that, you know, they're, they're still in one piece. Obviously the cap size wasn't, wasn't ideal, but um, it's a fantastic opportunity to really push ourselves and, and push the boat hard against an, an opponent. And uh, Ben and the British guys did a fantastic job today. They, they started extremely well um, and they were excellent opponents for us around the track. So hats, hats off to those guys. Pretty, uh, pretty exciting yachting and uh, one of those ones that I think at the end of the day, um, everyone's really enjoying the practice. So those guys race pretty soon and they'll, they'll be really ready to get into it. Yeah, they get it. They understand. But, Nathan, where do Emirates Team New Zealand go from there? Well, I can guarantee you one thing. They can't do that in racing. Um, I'm sure Grant Dalton went to them that evening and said, boys, training time's now over and you need to sail that boat at a higher level. You can't be making mistakes like that in racing. And we saw on the day two of the practice racing that Peter Burling and his crew nailed the starts. They were executing the racing really well. And it was like... They got the rocket that they needed to pull your heads in and sail this boat as if you're going to win the America's Cup. Your training time's over. So tomorrow it's all on to be the challenger for the 36th America's Cup. And there are legions of fans around the city and around the world that are just waiting to see the Prada Cup get busy. And it all starts tomorrow. And these are the pairings that you can look forward to in race day number one of the Prada Cup. First up, it's Dean Barker against Subin Ainsley in race one at 3.15 local time. And then scheduled an hour later, yes, Enios Team UK will be back into it against the challenger of record, Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli. So now we have to put the heat on the experts. So here we go. Shirley first, what's the key to winning the Prada Cup? You know, if you're a sailing fan, this month of the Prada Cup is really mouthwatering. It's unmissable. And I think all of us will say you cannot pick a favourite. It's too close to call. I think the key is chipping away, developing every day. And I think we'll see the boats looking a lot different at the end of the Prada Cup to the beginning. Yeah, straight off that, like I think that everyone's going to keep developing, but I think on the race course, you just can't make mistakes. We've seen a lot of unforced errors by teams, you know, bad manoeuvres, some bad pre-start execution, going out of bounds. If you do something like that when it counts in racing, you're going to lose and you're going to go home early. Starting is back. People, uh, people dismiss the fact that we went from reaching starts, the last two cup campaigns on foiling boats, to now we're going upwind again. You can get your elbows out in these big boats on these narrow race courses if you get that first cross. We always used to talk about you gotta win the first cross. You gotta get a good start, win the first cross. Excited? You're all excited? Tell me, you're excited. <laughs> You're, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely Let's excited. It. Let's get into it. It's the Prada Cup and the Battle Royale begins tomorrow on the Waitamata Harbour. Wherever you are around the world, brace yourself because it is going to go off. Tomorrow, talk is cheap. Winning is everything. And remember, there is no second.